always come out of that little video intro with my head bobbing, which hopefully everybody understands that that's, there's a good purpose to that. Anyway, we are back here for Think and Link live um, to the world. Uh, we have a wonderful conversation coming up with Krupa and Christopher, who I swear if you put those two names together, Krupa and Christopher, we've almost got a new brand name for something. Yeah, it yeah. sounds like, which I'm not, you know, pushing ideas for a new business venture, but <laughs> perhaps, you know, we put those two things together. It could be interesting. So, um, and our two friends are going to introduce themselves. They're going to get a little, give a little background on themselves. Uh, but before that, I want to give a little bit of credit to Capsule, uh, the firm that puts this on. We are a special projects firm here in Minneapolis. And we do this um, to provide some inspiration, to provide some conversation, to provide some perspective uh, for those in our world and our community. And, uh, and this particular one has, has a theme. And we're going to be talking about clean beauty um, with these two guests, um, though Anytime you have a theme, you're going to probably vary from the theme inevitably. So um, we're going to go off on tangents, I'm sure, which is fine and good. Um, I would uh, have you all, um, as you're watching this and viewing this, if you have questions, please put them in the chat in LinkedIn or in Twitter. You should be able to find that fairly easily, and we will address those that we can. Um, if you're going to ask anything about a particular celebrity that Christopher knows, um, trust me, he will not give you anything. I've tried many times. Um, he's not going to give you any details. Um, Jess Galba is Jess Galba, and that's that's all, right? We're not going to talk about her hair fashion or anything else. Um, and I and trust me, I've tried many times. Um, so anyway, that's all I've got as a preamble. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly, who's doing the the Southern background yes. doing this on vacation. Very kind of her to step in and do this on her vacation. She's amazing. Um, <laughs> Kelly, take it away from here. Thank if you, you don't Aaron. mind. Yes. Streaming live from Savannah, Georgia. Um, we are so excited, Christopher and Krupa, to have you here today. Um, a lot of topics we want to cover. We'll try to cover as much as we can in, in the 55 minutes we have here today. Um, but just thrilled to have you here. I know in our pre-conversations, a lot of meaty topics we want to dig into um, that I think will be certainly relevant to our audience today. Uh, so without further ado, I would love to have you both give a little background um, about yourselves, how you came here to us today. And uh We'll go from there. So Krupa, if you could please take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so I am Krupa Kesslein. I am a cosmetic chemist um, and I specialize in clean beauty or natural and organic beauty. Um, I've been in the industry for over a decade, a little, yeah, quite a bit over a decade. And, um, and uh, I own a cosmetic uh, consulting firm where we help brands, uh, small, mid, large size brands with uh, their product strategy as well as product formulations. Great, thanks Krupa. Christopher. Kelly and Aaron, thank you so much for having me. It's good seeing you both. Hi, I'm Christopher Gavigan, everyone. Um, I am the co-CEO and founder of Prima, also the co-founder of The Honest Company. And uh, my background really is around purpose-driven missions and enterprise, social enterprises. I feel that I've dedicated myself to really helping um, empower consumers around healthy, non-toxic, sustainable, healthy, happy, long lives. And, um, and so a lot of my work has been around education and um, clarity and also providing the best in class products. And so I'm excited to talk to you all today, especially you, Krupa. Um, thanks for <laughs> thanks for taking the time. I can't wait to pick your brain. Oh my God. I'm so excited to share the stage with you, Chris. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a love fest. I love it. Um, no, thank you both. We're, we're excited to, to get rolling. I'm going to start with a, a, a simple definition question from both of you to sort of set the stage for our conversation today. You know, we've had those, those discussions around wellness and how it continues to be the greatest underlying theme for trends in beauty, self-care, food and beverage, you name it. And consumers are really incorporating wellness into nearly every part of their personal care regimen um, and really are demanding now clean ingredients, natural ingredients. It's, it's the basis of their self-care products. Can we start, please, if you could both share your definition of clean beauty, which I think is a term we said, you know, a decade ago, that wasn't the term that we used. So I'd love to hear from both of you your definition of, and then we'll talk about um, what that means um, in the world today. So Krupa, could you start please with your definition of clean beauty? Yes, so um, clean beauty, which has been rather, you know, disdained these days, 
Um, clean beauty um, to me means safer products, safer products for the individual, for the consumer, um, for long-term use, as well as safer for the environment. Um, that is my short and sweet definition of clean beauty. Great. Thank you. Christopher, what can you add there? I, I think that sure. clean beauty, as uh, Kubrid said, has been mislabeled, misbranded, and adulterated. Sorry mm. for the pun. And um, the the definition is not a formal def def definition by any regulatory or compliance standards um, here in the States anyway. And so um, it, it's my opinion that the the definition of clean beauty and or healthy, natural, non-toxic beauty really comes from the human, the person, the brand, the the representation of the, the human element. And so that's certainly a, uh, a commentary on principles and values and, um, and standards. But I would define um, clean beauty really being products that are formulated without certain questionable and harmful and harsh ingredients and they are exclusionary of carcinogens and neurotoxins and developmental toxins and endocrine disruptors and things that cause organ toxicity or mm -hmm. just DNA and cellular damage in addition to the planet piece of environmental um, damage and harm as well. So it's that's a fairly broad definition, but it, it really it, it creates the appropriate guidelines and um, uh, guardrails to mm -hmm. with which you can really help understand like what this space of clean chemical policy is all about. That's really helpful. And we expect it abroad. And, it, and I think opinions yeah. and definitions differ, but this certainly sets the stage for the conversation we'd like to have today. And Aaron, I know you have a question coming out of, of those definitions um, that I think can get us rolling. Yeah. First, I want to acknowledge that I think Krupp is our first chemist on our stage. Um, so, and we, we tried in our pre-call to make sure we, you know, stayed away from going too deep on chemistry, but I do, I do have a, uh, just a desire to hear some of the stuff when she starts talking about chemistry, it's really rather fascinating um, as, a, as a chemist. So, but the, the idea of, of transparency um, and, um, and brands being as transparent as possible, I'm curious each of your perspectives about how you're seeing that show up and how that, and the importance of that for labeling um, and some of the things that you'd like to see pr potentially change around that. There was something that we talked about. I don't remember the term you used um, about the, the, I want to say incidentals, but um, it was the, uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on that group on, on the idea of transparency and brands labeling more appropriately for what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, definitely like because of the growth in clean beauty that we've seen and the consumer demand um, that we've seen and, and all the questions that the consumers ask um, and, and, you know, what the consumers need in order to put brand trust um, you know, on, on, on a brand. Um, I think transparency is like a given, especially in the clean beauty wor world. Mm -hmm. I think that that is just expected of a lot of brands um, in the sector. Um, and and uh, I'll clarify myself, clean beauty, that, that actually is clean beauty, right? There's a lot of greenwashing too, uh, that I'm sure Christopher would love to talk about as well. Um, so there's a lot of brands that call themselves clean and aren't really clean, but real clean beauty brands who are committed um, to the purpose and who are really, who understand um, product development accordingly, then I, I definitely transparency is a given. Um, it also helps that California just um, passed the Fragrance Transparency Act. And, you know, fragrance used to be one of the biggest, um, biggest, uh, like, contributor to having chemicals in your products that weren't disclosed. Um, and, and so it's a big change. Um, and I think everybody is, uh, you know, mandated to, to do so, uh, it, it, in California, everything that's sold in California, I think that's a big change and, and it, it'll definitely propel more transparency from, um, the brands. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been in the space for, um, about two decades now, specifically, um, the environmental health space. So how we collide, connect and, are 
really creating positive and negative health outcomes by with which, which how we connect to our natural environment and the world and the environment is not somewhere out there it's in on and around our bodies and so it's what we put in our mouth every day what we put on our skin every day and our largest organ it is we are a reflection of our environment and so early in my career i spent um spent time around that empowerment education and um and, and, and as an advocate and calling out brands in the NGO space and building consumer awareness and driving the mandate around what it means to be healthier and safer and more and non-toxic and what it, what consumers could do to collectively raise their voice in demand, right? The brands are only moving, what I see is brands are moving into this space in the last decade because consumers have platforms and and places to with which they uh, vocalize their opinion and so if a brand is not peeling the layers back and not demonstrating a level of trust and clarity and transparency and accountability then they will be co completely canceled and mm -hmm. so i i'm a i'm a big believer that consumers their consumers are demanding it but now there's a moral imperative for um brands to be responsive because the science is there around certain toxicants in our world synthetic and man-made and and uh petroleum derivatives it's in us it's in our it, it's a body burden within us now and that mm -hmm. is now that translates into a disease burden um that mm -hmm. you know that beautiful yet terrible um and horrific 2009 study from the ewg demonstrating that the average baby is born in 2009 with 287 chemicals coursing through their veins at the time of birth, synthetic oh man-made. So it is, it, and how do those chemicals get there? Mom is passing them on, right? Mm -hmm. That womb that is not this beautiful um, sanctuary of purity. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is now in us. And so we, you know, toxicologists, endocrinologists, chemists, environmental health um, scientists, we're all trying to unpack. And, and, and we, we, what we need to do is move away from the world of playing whack-a-mole and really mm -hmm. be thoughtful and holistic on how we demonstrate that level of transparency. Because transparency is really just accountability, right? right. Show me that you're doing something. Demonstrate yeah. got yeah. The, the values and commitment and unapologetic rigor within your process that you're prioritizing human health, not your bottom line, but human health. That's different. Um, yeah. and, and, and you can see a shift in the marketplace. And, and thankfully, there are thoughtful human-led brands that are um, uh, championing that, that purpose-driven mindset. Yeah. Great perspective. Wow. Christopher, yeah. good. I'd love to stay in that same vein because we talked about this a little bit in our pre-conversation with regard to retailers. So we talked about brands and their accountability and responsibility. I'd love both of you to share your perspective on what role retailers can play in vetting their brand partners, ensuring that they meet that high standard of responsible practices and certainly clean ingredients, transparency, et cetera. What role, and I, I, again, I know that's a, that's a rabbit hole and there's a lot to cover no. there. But any perspective you'd be willing to share, I think would be wonderful to hear. Yeah, I'll jump in first because I'd love to hear Krupa's, uh, uh, um, because I know Krupa works with many brand founders and executives um, as a as a NGO leader and then rolling into um, building out the Honest Company in the early 10s and um, launching in 20, uh, 2010 or 2012, excuse me, the what we were doing is we were demonstrating a level of consistency and care and commitment around um the the ingredients to the parts per billion and mm -hmm. having a representation of documentation on sourcing and, and materials and the qq of the formula and real and then showing that to the only one that really could manage it is um a retailer because the federal government they are not the guardian at the gate they are not they the, the the people that allow or disallow certain chemicals into the environment um, on the product side so mm -hmm. you might source your trust when you're going into a whole foods or a target or name the retailer and you might think oh my gosh they've done the job some brands like those two have but other many brands have not excuse me many retailers have not and so retailers are the regulators they had great chemical 
policy in the last decade. They are demonstrating a level of curation when it comes to fulfilling on the consumer mandate that um, there is so much of a, a proud and loud vocal stance for um, healthier, more non-toxic products and, and ingredients and a level of transparency. Like I turn that bottle around and I can see what's inside. Um, right. And we'll get to incidentals in a minute, Aaron, but retailers are a, a fabulous representation of uh, responsiveness and they are working with brands. For instance, Prima, the brand that I'm overseeing now worked in collaboration for almost a year with LVMH Sephora and creating an own standard in a category underneath their clean standard that they felt like they needed to have a point of view on. And that's mm. not because that's because yes, they were seeing a dirty and, and, um, disintegrated marketplace, but they were also hearing a, a, a need from consumers and they were mm -hmm. watching the fact that they needed to take a responsible approach to it. So retailers are, and, and one of the most powerful curators and um, guardians of the industry right now. Yeah. That's well, they own. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I was just saying that, that, that the importance of that relationship, they, you know, they've taken ownership of the relationship between the consumers and the brands. The brands yeah. have had to go through them. And to have a really solid relationship, you'd hope it would be an honest relationship, right? Something where there's an exchange of information um, and, and transparency where possible. Um, it, is, it is hard to be 1,000% um, transparent, but it is possible we can move into a better direction. Anyway, I'll, yeah. Krupa, you have, look like you have something to add to that in yeah. a big way. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with um, Christopher. I think that um, retailers definitely um, are uh, making sure that um, the innovation happens in the clean space and that, you know, brands move uh, towards uh, more clean and natural formulas. And, and it's great. But, you know, uh, a part of me also questions these lists and, and really like the, the skeptical part of me is like, OK, is this just a marketing tactic? Um, at some level uh, on the retailer side or are the retailers really doing the due diligence that they need to be doing, right? Like me and you both know, Christopher, like how how the whole submission process works with uh, with retailers and like how, what kind of due diligence? Do they look into incidentals? Do they look into the actual documents? Do they audit the manufacturers to make sure they're doing what they're saying they're doing? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also like, I think that all these retailers having different standards. I mean, I live and breathe these standards, so it's not, it, I understand it, but I can't expect a normal consumer to understand the clean list from Sephora and the clean list from Credo and the clean list from Beauty Heroes and the clean his list from like every, you know, Ulta. Like how, how is a normal consumer gonna decipher uh, yeah. the list? It's mm -hmm. incredibly hard. And that's why, unless they're working with NGO partners, like mm -hmm. the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics and EWG's work or, um, you know, Women's Voices for the Environment or in the past, Healthy Child, Healthy World, unless they're working with third party NGO, science, research, academic um, advocates, then one would question it too. And I agree with you. I, at first there was like, oh my God, we got to be responsive in market, market, market. And now I, I do believe that there is, I mean, I've sat at many, many a long conference room table in, in HQ around the country. And um, there is there are real advocates, right? And, and I think a lot of them, as we know, well, this, this clean movement has come out and been birthed out another pun, out of active, passionate, vocal moms. They're yeah. like, oh my gosh, I'm going through a great moment of transform transformation, equal parts, moment of paralysis. This is my baby. I will do everything yeah. as a mama bear and be protective. And oh my gosh, I also have a job outside the house and it's called Executive X, Y, or Z company. And mm -hmm. I've seen so many, you know, like, Beauty Heroes is a phenomenal example. Target is another great example. Sephora is an awesome example. They read books. They're 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 digesting mom's blogs right back when, and they're like, wait, what? How, wait, what brands? And they're doing their own research. And so mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a yes and um, to your your 
lovely and appropriate skepticism um, because that's necessary for sure on, on, on the true intention. But I always go back to, and as Cooper, you know, because you work with so many brand founders, it's really about the brand founder. Yes. Are they are they a purity champion? Is it in their DNA? Do they yes. passionately believe, believe? Do they care so deeply that, as you know, how many times of, of, at the bench top, or, there's a redirect, there's a redirect, there's a redirect, and mm -hmm. the redirects only happen because of founders that say, no, that's not good enough. It, aesthetics or ingredients or what you name it. So um, it's really about brand founders and the why. Um, they are building the product. They are building. I feel like you're trying to bring Jessica Alba into the conversation here, Christopher. <laughs> I, she, there's, a, I, there's an example. She's a great I, example. I, of that. A great example. I mean, she was a, a a very passionate mom that had a horrible allergic reaction, as many people are. She's just a reflection of moms that were saying, "Oh my gosh, you've alerted me. You've alarmed me. You consume me. Mm -hmm. You concern me as an um, NGO. You know, you've written a book. You've created these." these brand partnerships, you've like created partnerships with WebMD to just tell me what to buy. Mm -hmm. and, um, the filter and, and, and bring to me um, safety and purity and, and uncompromising standards. And I think that that is why, you know, honestly, honest was birthed out of that intention. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many examples of that throughout the marketplace and throughout communities around this globe that brands start with um, a, a passionate female that is will stop at nothing to get it done. Amen, Christopher. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. And it and just thank you both for sharing your, your thoughts there. It just to hear there's the complexities around ingredients and the impact they have, the incidentals, which we'll talk about. I do want to talk about that because it's it's fascinating, horrifying. A lot of layers there as well, um, yeah. but there are some, you know, uh, stop gaps. There's some new checks and balances that are coming to the forefront now that brands can say, now I know how I can take my passion for clean ingredients, doing better, being responsible and bring that to my products and then thus, you know, to the consumer. Um, yeah. So it, again, I know there's a lot to talk about there, but I you can hear the passion in both of your voices that we're moving in the right direction. And that's whether it's retailers, it's governing bodies, than certainly the brands themselves um, making those changes. So, so thanks for sharing that, Erin. Let's. I know you have a question there around the incidentals. Can we talk about that? Because um, yeah, we keep we keep mentioning purpose. incidentals. I know. I know. I know. And we gotta. I know yeah. it's the kind of thing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that I, I ran into the idea of incidentals in spices because they don't have to list their ingredients. It was like, wait a minute, why don't spices have to list their ingredients? That seems, seems kind of scary. Um, but now in talking to you two about this, it's like, no, that's everywhere. Incidentals are, and if we're talking about things in the womb and in, you know, inside our babies, that just horrifies me. But, um, Cooper, you want to talk, you want to introduce the concept of incidentals and what that means and so everybody else can get their head around it. And yeah, and I'll try. Um, it might become a little too technical, but I'll try. So we love, we love technical. We love technical. That's okay. Yes. So, um, so basically, um, incidentals are ingredients um, that are a mixture of ingredients, right? And in this mixture of ingredients, there's a certain ingredient that is only there maybe at 0.00001%, right? So it's in most likely a preservation system or alcohol or something that is used uh, to, to maintain the integrity of that ingredient. When you add that to your formula, technically you would imagine in a perfect world that you would list all the ingredients that the particular raw material comprises of. Mm -hmm. But there's a caveat in the rule of listing ingredients for cosmetics that if it is if anything is be, is below 0.01% and it wasn't it wasn't intentionally added by the brand, so it was added by the raw material manufacturer, then you can leave it off the label. Yep. Mm. So what what happens is ingredients like this i have a pet peeve ingredient like um methyl isothiazolinone which we can call mit yes. um is yeah. is one that um you literally have like i if i'm making a wok like a big you know barrel of a uh, product i literally have to add one drop of mit and it'll preserve the whole product and mit is a very well known 
allergen. Um, and the chlorophyte, the, the chlorine version of that is actually uh, banned in Europe uh, because of that. And it, there was a big, I'm sure Christopher is aware of the whole, the butt wipes uh, incident, right? There was, there was a big company who had a big recall because they had MIT in their butt wipes and then people were having all these um, really bad reactions. Um, and I, was it a baby product too? Christopher, was it a, yeah, it was a baby product too. And so, yeah, yeah, that's that's incidentals for you. I mean, and and here's what you need to know about incidentals, it, because look, what what we're talking about is low doses, and low, 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 low doses matter a whole lot, mm. especially in the world of toxicology, right? So it's not yes, the mixtures make make the poison, but so do the concentrations, and mm. so if you think about exposures, they you they're, they're they're ubiquitous. And these small, 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 I mean, think about one, the one drop, the parts per billion that Krupa was talking about. One drop in an Olympic sized swimming pool is parts per billion. Mm. Or think about another analogy, which I love, is one pancake in a stack of pancakes that go 4,000 miles high. So parts per billion is extremely small, but it impacts us. And, and it impacts us in a, in, a, in a very complex way. And so these incidentals, whilst there's no regulatory framework that requires, it's up to the brand and the, and the, and the chemist at the bench to say, okay, let's look at this. Here's one, two, and three raw material supplier. Where are we going to get a raw material? And what is it? What's the carrier or what is the preservation system? Or what are some of these incidentals that are in there? They'll, they'll never hit my label, but what are they in there? So again, that's the level of, 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 mm. of restriction and care and standard that, uh, that the brand needs to hold itself accountable to. And at Prima, we talk about it all the time. Uh, we talk about it openly on our website. Like, so I encourage brands, excuse me, I encourage the public. And first thing I do when I go to a new brand, I go right to the About Us page. What are you guys talking about? What are your standards? How are you viewing science? Who are you? What gives you the right to be, even be on this page? Um, yeah. What are your backgrounds? Um, you know, I, just because you see some white space in the industry doesn't mean you belong there. Like re really, what's what's driving the level of technical expertise? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Krupa and I know that the science of any organization is the bedrock for which that brand stands on. It's the bedrock. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. everything else is layered it, it, on top of it. So, yeah, um, I uh, incidentals are a passion of mine because they are the, and they can be. And just like um, fragrance, fragrances are the Trojan horse of the industry. Mm. Everything else in there, mm -hmm. and you don't use one word fragrance on the label. Brands, you know, the honest company, Prima, alike. We will never use fragrance. Um, even essential oils, you got to be very careful with those because there's a ton of known allergens in essential oils. You got to be extremely careful. But even natural fragrance is is no good in my book. So yeah. um, I, I I just it's a word of caution and awareness. And hey, don't put your don't you know don't do the ostrich effect and bury your head in the sand. Lift right. up, turn the label around, and check it out. And and what do the brands stand for? And double click into these places into these brand platforms that you, they need to be talking about these things because if they're not, they're not doing action against it. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's a level of awareness for the brand and education that has to happen there first. And then that's passed on to the consumer in terms of how do we tell the story of, and to your point, Christopher, we all go to the about us page. If it's a mission driven organization or they're saying we have clean ingredients in our products, yeah. I want to know what that means. What does it mean to that brand? And then dig deeper but you're right, the consumer, there's still an education for the consumer to understand what they're reading and, and, and is it accurate with regard mm -hmm. to what's actually happening in the product. Um, so I'd love to, if we could, Krupa, because I know we had this conversation around your role as a, as a chemist and as a consultant, um, the types of conversations that you're having with brand leaders, with stakeholders, when it comes to not only the holistic benefits of clean ingredients and, and integrating them into their products, but but also to see through the, you, you nailed it when you said these marketing tactics, which we can call greenwashing, 
how do they see through that as a tactic and say, we need to um, really, you know, work through the buzzwords and tell the consumer and in a way that's meaningful and educational about why clean ingredients matter and how. So just if you could touch on what types of conversations you're having with brand leaders, um, I think it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah, um, for sure. So for, for brand leaders um, that are already established in the space, they are already aware of where they stand. Where it is so hard for little brand founders, like founders that are still establishing themselves, not everybody has a Jessica Alba on their founder team. So it's hard for little brands to, you know, make a difference and to really convey or like to really communicate their passion to mm -hmm. a consumer. Um, right. And especially if like they're not from the industry, they don't they want to do the right thing, but they don't know how or they don't know all the stuff. So most of the times I am educating my clients mm -hmm. to make sure that they make the right choices. There's a lot of misconception when it comes to clean beauty um, from I don't know way back when where, you know, people uh, think that, oh, if it's natural and organic, it's not going to work. Right. Yeah. Or if it's mm -hmm. if it's. It's, if it's uh, if it's clean, it probably you're not going to see any difference, uh, which is not true anymore. It it might have been the case 20 years ago, maybe when we didn't really have any uh, ingredients, clean ingredients to work with. Uh, it was you know the shea butters and the cocoa butters, and and that's it. Um, so we have evolved so much, and so when I select ingredients, right, I look at sustainability, I look at uh, sourcing transparency, I look at efficacy. Too. So just because something is botanical doesn't mean that it is not efficacious. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, it's all about education. Like I, I come constantly educating my clients to make sure that they understand like, okay, you want to use retinoids because the consumer is asking for retinoids, but here's the data, here's the study where this plant extract is so much better than retinol. Right. So, so we do that for our brands and, 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 um, yeah, that's that's how we uh, steer the conversation. Yeah. And Christopher, I know you've been part of these as a brand founder, as a brand leader, and you've been in multiple conversations, I'm sure, certainly around how do we tell that story to the consumer? How do we articulate or translate the technical language to something that's meaningful to someone who's buying your product off the shelf? Can you provide some perspective around how you've seen that evolve over time? Yeah, I, it, as as Krupa was um, identifying the past, um, I, I think we didn't have the technical expertise and or the raw material suppliers doing enough clinical research, both instrumentation as well as consumer perception on what these more natural botanical derivatives and plant um, derived pro, uh, ingredients were doing. But yeah. as the as this clean industry and natural industry is evolving, you're seeing a lot of these innovative raw materials coming to market for brand founders to really look at. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's that, that it is, it is now not clean. Clean is now the mandate. If you can't bring out a product in the world, unless it has some type of clean standard or commitment to clean. So clean is, is thankfully, which I'm, I'm a big believer in and the, the results orientation as Krupa was saying is, Clean needs to be uh, uh, only validated by the clinical um, side of the uh, of the science and um, the uh, the the validation side. So clean, it's now it's clinical, uh, clinical as of what many people are saying. So clean yeah. plus clinical, and that clinical side is, hey, here's a raw at this particular amount, right? You have to put it at the efficacious amount. Very important. Mm -hmm. You can't make claims against it. If you don't, right, and that's a claims conversation, but <laughs> um, that it's validated at this percentage to see X, Y, and Z results, right? And that that clinical results, and you could, and that's on the one ingredient. You also can do a clinical study that is on the entire formulation, and mm -hmm. that is that's also a very important um, conversation. And we're seeing evolution in, in this clean natural space because. You're, you're needing to show efficacy and results and performance and a qualitative change in the in, in um, someone's regimen. So I, I get really excited about the evolution of the industry moving towards more uh, clinicals and more validation. Um, mm -hmm. Because as Cooper said, you can't just 
sprinkle in a natural ingredient and get a nice label claim and um, and think you've got a product that is that is that is not well developed science um, form uh, formula science and um, and just just chassis development it just it's just it's, it's just not yeah great ah, yeah. <laughs> chassis development. Did you just say chassis development? No, oh, chassis. chassis development. Oh, let's get into chassis. Can we talk about that? Let's get into chassis. Let's talk about chassis. Let's talk about chassis. Actually, my next question kind of relates to chassis anyway, because it's uh, it's cultural stuff, which I find a fascinating thing as it relates to this anyway, because it's um, to create a culture around this. Um, uh, the the healthy skeptic skepticism that Krupa you know displays, and she's given us some of her background at other organizations, which we won't speak to directly because we don't want to trash anybody that's not doing good things or has struggled to do good things. If there are some, um, not that there are not implying any guilt there anyway. Um, but the, um, I'm curious about culture and how, um, how important it is and, and how you, um, facilitate, um, a culture of clean or a cult culture of, of, um, of looking deeper on these subject areas. Um, do either of you want to take that one first? It's a tough one. It's a big one. It's a, Christopher, I you open your mouth first. Well, my team is really small. Uh, I have a small team of scientists. We're like six people, six employees. And uh, we're all, um, my hiring criteria when I was putting together my team, which was a big deal, right? Um, it was my first, it's my first team that I put together myself. So it's, it's a big deal. And um, one of the main things was I just wanted to be to make sure that they understand uh, what we're doing here, right? We're we're trying to help the smaller brands um, get to uh, where they need to go and create this change in the in the industry, right? And and create beautiful products that that um, that change the industry. And I think that everybody we ended up hiring is so much passionate. Like they, they are so so passionate about green chemistry. Um, one of them comes from, you know, with a master's in sustainability and, and they're all, they all have backgrounds where they really are passionate about the industry. I think because of that, the whole culture is just, it's just so like, um, you know, I think team oriented and also like very, everybody's very much in, invested in, um, all of our projects and, and yeah, that's, that's how the culture works here. They live and breathe it. Yeah, mm -hmm. back to the word passion again. Yeah, the importance of passion. Christopher, you were anxious to answer that one. Yeah, I, I think it's it's everything. It is is it is the heartbeat. It is the drumbeat. Is the rally cry. It's the north star. You know, call it all those things because it is it is the words and the the mantra and the ethos that wraps like a warm blanket around the entire organization. So, it really is that um, lovely fabric. And in my again, I, I don't have the traditional business pedigree. I have the science pedigree um, around environmental health, and that and that's why I went into the world of and the NGO advocacy side for almost a decade because I just felt like I needed to get get the word out. Um, but you know, so coming from a, a mission driven NGO and then writing this book in two thousand eight, um, healthy child, healthy world, it it, it was. It was easy for me to walk into and create a business and recruit and bring in folks because I was equipping them with information, but then it was an expression of just our core values and who we were. And so scaling that impact and scaling that advocacy and that, um, and that positive change was not hard because everyone came through and, and at, at the Honest Company, it's quite a large organization. And so they every new person would sit down with me and I, first it was very intimate and then it got bigger, but we would go through these sessions and learn about brand and, and product and mission and, and the why, right. And, mm -hmm. you know, Simon, Simon Sinek talks about that a lot and it gets overused a little bit, but it really, it is, it is the thing that it, it, it creates evangelism and creates a, a level of affinity and loyalty and, and trust but it creates conviction that people want to stay and really give all of themselves to, because it's not just about, again, creating, making widgets. And especially the young people of today, they want to be involved. They need to be involved with some type of force of positive good and change in the world. Right. Yeah. It's, it's 
we're seeing this disillusion of trust around institutions and government and medicine. Like they need to do something of 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 of, of, of something around positive, steadfast, pioneering change. So I I, I think it is everything, and it is um and, and because once you once you hook those people in, for instance, folks at the Alice Company early days you know they would stay with us four or five six years which is unheard of in an early stage environment with a young um a young um employee base but then they have gone on and created these amazing brands that have that same passion which is so exciting um so as group is you know bringing her passion into organizations and demonstrating um that level of commitment around the product hopefully those that like that permeates the entire culture and that's where I think it, it again, it comes from the bottom up and it starts with the science and starts with the, the, the trusted um, uh, purpose by with which you're, um, you know, building that team and building that brand. You know, I'm curious here, Christopher, if you don't mind, um, what did the core core team at Honest Company look like, like in the early stages? Yeah, what did amazing. you guys have? Like what departments? Uh, at the early stages, I oversaw all product for close to seven years. So I was chief product officer um, and this product was brand brand marketing, brand position. Um, at, at that time, we had an ops team, we had a fulfillment team, the most important team. And then you have the, your traditional finances and whatnot. Um, but the most important team is customer service team because mm -hmm. the customer service team was really leveraged as a listening agent, but mm -hmm. also as a an agent for empowerment and education. And that team, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I would lift up my, like pick up the phone and call customers because it was a place that I needed to like fulfill and connect and realize why I'm there. Cause we're in service. You are in service of a consumer, one person. And that person has their own story and their own challenges. And so I loved connecting with that team and that, um, and customers and I would call folks you know, five up, five down, um, five new every week. And it was a place for me to also develop and create innovative products um, based on what that consumer insight and, and demand was telling you. Um, because that that is that is the, the most critical. And when, when we were building those products around, um, I think around your question is, if you're gonna build for a customer set, who you're really building for, you're just building for yourself. So Jessica and Alba uh, and I, as brand founders, were like, it was two year or two and a half years of nights and weekends, and we were just building the brand that we wanted. And mm -hmm. 17 products launching and and like here's the 17 products, and there's so many in investors were like, 17 products, that's too many. What's your one product? What's your MVP? And I was like, the brand's the MVP, yeah. right? It is right. The, the, the brand commitment is the MVP, and everything else is going to come from it. So um that's uh but the customer you, to be in service of a customer that's really that and having a, an access into them is the most important part um of, of, a, of a great brand i think that's a great story love that great question krupa yes uh, can i ask a question can i field krupa question yes please okay krupa so you're in conversation with founders and executives and um all, all the passionate few and um, within an organization, and they are coming from a, his, a traditional historic platform, right? How do you feel it is best for them to shift that? And, and it could be very well intentioned, but how do you feel like it's best for them to shift both the science and the the narrative around product and formulation within a larger organization? Is it starting with a small franchise? Is it Com completely redoing the whole product line. How do you? How are you watching and or empowering and um, telling or guiding people through that shift and through that change to cleaner, safer, healthier? So for brands that are already established and already have a, already have an offering, it is challenging. And most of the times, what we've done is either created a franchise, um, like you say, and then, you know, waited for the franchise to take off so that they could phase out all the other um, old, um, not so great products. Or 
Um, or uh, what we've done is we have very slowly phased consumers in because you need the consumer buy-in. You also need like your existing customers to still stay loyal to your brand with even with the change. Um, yeah. So changing yeah. from a fragrance product to a non-fragrance product is is very challenging, uh, especially when the consumer is used to you always having that that fragrance that they love, right? So. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely like education, a lot of education um, helps, but also slowly and um, strategically moving away from those chemicals because some of those chemicals are totally like EDTA, yeah. which is which is one of the ingredients that you'll find in um, in your cosmetics is totally replaceable uh, now. And, and you would hardly not notice a difference in the performance of the product. So some of those things are literally like you could just go do it and the consumer is not going to have a bad experience with your product. But then there are, there, there are things like fragrances where you have to educate the consumer and get them on board and, and slowly um, phase them out. But it's, it's fun to see how that happens. It's a lot of, it's a great process. It's a great process. And, and Kelly and Aaron, if uh, may, I'm going to ask one more question. Please. Because anyone, anyone from clean beauty and brand will know that there is the, the largest sticking point around preservative systems mm. and but right now what preservative system anything <laughs> water that sits on shelves has a preservative system right because you have mitotoxic yes. behavior and bacterial contamination yeah. the whole lot so it's bacteria is bad in products so you want to mitigate and manage um so preservative systems what are you liking right now what are you seeing coming out um any insight and points of view there Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, you heard here great. <laughs> free advice, free advice. No, this is great. Um, I love the question. So, um, you know, if you are, if you are a traditional chemist and you've always been trained with like traditional preservation systems, it's as easy as just putting a drop of MIT, like we talked about, or putting a drop of parabens in something and calling it a day with natural preservation systems. It's so much more complicated. So let's say, you know, a, a cleanser would not react well to a particular um, natural preservation system compared to how like your eye cream would um, just because of how the emulsions are like, you know, uh, and, and the systems, the chemistry. So the, some of the things that I rely on most are uh, sodium libulinate, sodium anisate, um, anisic acid, sal acid. Um, let's see, um, fermented extracts, right? The lactobacillus extract that's quite popular um yeah benzyl alcohol too but at very very low levels uh where it's not um gonna be an issue and then potassium sorbate um sorbic acid um all of those awesome Love wow that. so if i looked could, could i see those ingredients would be listed on a label as yeah. these okay so I'm, this is good this is recorded because I will go back, Aaron. We, you and back, I, can yes. go back. We'll go we back. Can we can both go back. Yes. What's and then start to compare our beauty products. Yeah. yeah that's See really. What's on there. And Christopher, yeah. you probably knew it. this was a foreign language. Some of it to me, but Christopher was like, yeah. uh huh, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think that was a that was a test question right there. And he was like, oh, yeah. it was that one. It was awesome. It was helpful because you, I, the traditional chemistry world is, as you said, they're like so rigid in their stance and like, mm -hmm. no, you can't change that up because you never know. And uh, obviously you have to do stability testing and you've got to ch do the uh, appropriate testing to make sure it, 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 it meets and exceeds shelf life and stability. But like there, there are so many other options and, and traditionally the um, preserve systems are really harsh and nasty for human health. So that's why I'm asking because I, I have a, a, a fragrance. I have a huge issue with fragrance, and I also have a big issue with preservatives. Yeah. Yeah. So, is this is a now we're totally in a different realm and totally off our list of questions. But the um the, the fragrance thing is there something because we've talked about this before. Like consumers need a shortcut. Um, you know, it, it, there's fair trade and food is tried to be something, but. Yeah, we've all heard my opinion on fair trade, and we're not going to talk about that. But um, there's, there's like, I need a signal, right? You need something out there that, and for some reason, it seems like fragrance is in that realm. Like if 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 that is one, is it is that a bad signal, right? Like, oh, if you see that, right, um, stay away or question or be skeptical. Or on the other side of thing, is there a positive signal? Like, where you can go, if I see this, 
you know, I should, I should let down my barriers of suspicion. Right. Yeah. I see it show up in a label. And Are there any things related to that? You can help us, you know, because we're not chemists and, and I, know, sometimes I, 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 I go really basic. If I see the word fragrance on any product, cleaning product, personal care product, any product, I avoid it. It never will come into my world. My, mm -hmm. my fans, nice. fragrance, just fragrance. Even natural fragrance. fragrance, even if it says natural yeah. fragrance, they're like, nope, that's even, even not natural fragrance. Okay. Wow. Okay, yeah. that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I just, again, I come from the science and medical and physiology world. So, mm -hmm. having seen and heard and like Dr. Phil Landergren at Mount Sinai now at uh, Boston College, like the godfather of environmental health. I mean, he took lead mm -hmm. out of gasoline in the late seventies. I mean, he is the he is the, the 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 drumbeat of this industry. I mean, yes, you've got the Rachel Car Carson's of the world, like mm -hmm. honor her, but he was like the actual medical professional and doctor for particularly around children and family. And, um, there's no way, there's no way fragrance done. Yeah. Out. Wow. So fragrance is like yes. lead and gasoline and lead and paint. That's yeah. interesting. Wow. I, I kind of have a, I, I think a different perspective or similar perspective, but also I appreciate, um, the chemistry a little bit. So I, kind of am, am open to certain natural fragrances, but it depends. It's it's a very, I think we can go on for an hour talking about fragrances and yes. all the compounds, right? That fragrances yes. comprise of. But for sure, like non-natural fragrances, stay away from. Yeah, I mean, look, because you can scent a product, like the product can be mm -hmm. scented, but how is it scented? And fragrance right. is not like the same as scent, right? Scent is the, mm. the olfactory essence that you're getting. Yeah. Fragrance is a term and an ingredient term that can house many, many. I've seen lists of fragrances that have been hundreds of ingredients long. That yes. is wow. and that just is fragrance, right? Yeah. So you've got to be again the Trojan horse. It is very hard for the consumer. So in a mm -hmm. in a world where consumers don't and and I and honor, respect, and admire all the the the, the chemistry, there's no fast pass way for a consumer mm -hmm. to know yes mm -hmm. unless they yeah. really know the science know the formulation know the brand like it's so hard so if you're shopping right. quickly i would say traditionally just avoid fragrance you're clear yeah. that's that's good insight yeah, sure. yeah. And, and i guess if we are if you're taking that approach then you know essential oils are aren't that great either and you have to yeah. be careful with Super the essential careful. oils um yeah. that that are you know used for some of these products um you know, yeah. yeah. So, do, do, so if you, um, are you a believer that if, if it has essential oils that they need to do RIPT and then have a hypoallergenic claim, like have some type of allergicity uh, claim uh, uh, in and around that product? Um, yes, but also there are certain, if you really understand essential oils, you understand that certain essential oils are just not meant for certain applications. So, yeah. Certain essential oils you should never put on your face. Exactly. Right. So certain essential, yeah, like certain essential oils, no, they are not meant for facial products. So you just don't do it. Um, and also, I mean, there are the IFRA guidelines that have like, you know, that tell you um, how, what level of, you can use an essential oil or a fragrance at. Um, but I don't know for sure um, if everybody's checking those or yeah. if everybody's, you know, making you don't know so um so yeah like all these all these companies right i mean i'm not bad mouthing anyone but there are all these essential oil companies that sell essential oil straight and we've all heard horror, horror stories <laughs> about those you know people burning themselves um and causing um allergic reactions uh, to to something like lavender or peppermint or lemon you know because yep. they don't know how to use it so yeah. We just got a great question from the audience, Erin. Did you see that pop up? This is yeah, a yeah. related, just a, a curiosity question, which I, I think is a good one to, to see what your, your thoughts are. What Dave asks, wondering if the harmful aspects of scent hold true for scented candles as well. 1,000%. Indoor air quality is often three to five times worse than outdoor air quality. Mm. And yeah. 
I, again, I'm, I, 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 can, I will call them out for breeze and all these Ooh, like odor yeah. cleansing, odor eliminating yeah. things, like they're really odor masking with fragrance. Mm. And so I would be hyper attentive to wow, if you yeah. want to burn a candle, ensure that the company has a position on not only the wax and the wick, because wicks can have lead, but also the scent um package in that candle and um and be fully transparent with what that is and what it isn't okay oh my oh, i know yeah, I that's a great question <laughs> my day thank you my, my pantry of candles but it, <laughs> it, you're right i mean this is where and it's not these aren't fear tactics we we understand no, this no, is no, it's just science. It's just yeah, like, and then that, that three to five, three to five times worse air quality is done by the EPA. That's like yeah, the yeah, EPA that level. I've seen. That's all yeah. over the place. Wow, yeah. wow, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Sometimes like you, like something smells good, and just cognitively you think, well, that must be good, but yeah. it can smell good and be very bad for you. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. just like same thing with food and any other thing yeah. you consume in different ways doesn't yeah, mean I mean, it's good for you. Yeah, the world yeah. of fla flavor and fragrance are synonymous, right? So in the food yeah. world. Flavor and in the beauty care, skincare, topicals world, it's fragrance. So yeah, wow, that's just, a good uh, just, just wise. And, and again, thought there are so many. There are great books. There are great articles. There are great NGOs. Like again, EWG is, does a phenomenal job. But there's so many others that have like again been champions of of clarity and um, committed to helping empower great consumers. And so. It's evolving. Brands are doing their jobs. They yeah. they're need to be held accountable even more. Um, and it starts at the parts per billion. Yeah. There we go. That's a, that's a good parts quote. Parts per billion. That's great. <laughs> I'm going to ask you that. this. Um, beyond Prima, obviously, what other brands, both of you, I'd love both of you to share this, um, do you think are doing well in this space? They're doing good. They're being responsible. They're being transparent. Call out just a you know, two or three that come to mind. Uh, go, Krupa, go ahead. Or can you? Are there enough brands doing good in the world? Okay. They're doing good in the world. You can't call out, you're putting us in a conflict of interest because you can't call out the brands you work with. Um, no, right. uh, no. Brands you don't work with. That you're saying, they're doing it right. They're doing um, it right. They are doing it right. Okay. Um, so brands that I don't work with. Oh my God, this is tough. <laughs> what about this? I'll make it easier. Instead of brands, perhaps just some practices that you're seeing brands. You don't have to call it the brand, but what no. are some of the practices that you're seeing that yes, they're doing this correctly? This is this is good. Yeah. So I am a fan of um, all the all the wonderful wonderful um, fragrance companies that are doing uh, fragrance development naturally. Michelle okay. Pfeiffer's company is actually a fantastic example. Like. It, so good um because you know it, consumers love fragrances right and and mm -hmm. traditional fragrances are like we've talked about on this like not great and, and they are a trojan horse and they don't have to disclose everything that's in there and on all that mm -hmm. and so i love what they are doing in being you know the whole taking that parts per billion approach to fragrances as well um yes. for sure and and i and i love it i think that 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 is something that you know uh is is fantastic innovation great that's great to hear christopher i know michelle love michelle and she's the real deal and she's partnered with ken from ewg for many many years she's mm -hmm. that brand is beautifully and pristine and and so lovely i'm a big fan of speaking of brands instead of the world of sustainability or 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 um validation like i i want brands to be more accountable and the mm. accountability piece for me is around greater depth around their testing protocols and their material validations and so you know selfish plug around prima you know we have a qr code on every on every box and that box leads to the batch records but not only the batch records but also the testing and validation that went on so during, was it like, how many times did you test? Like we do five times and it's in process, it's like raw material and in process and then finished goods. And what are you testing for? Potency, terpene levels, bacterial mm -hmm. contamination, residual solvents, allergenicity, skin safety, any other adulterated testing, pesticides, insecticides, 
you know, heavy metals for sure, mitotoxins, as we talked about earlier. So, sh and showing those back, those results, right? Mm, like, yeah. You say you're doing them. Now show me the third party independent um, tests that validate and verify purity and potency and free of um, pollutants. So I'm a huge fan of that. And that that is you're going to see that more and more and more because it is a it, outside of, of approach to safety it's approach to quality and um i believe that brands need to do that even more qr codes are becoming much more ubiquitous mm -hmm. easy as anything um yeah. and sh you know show me don't tell me and right. you think yeah. that is that's going to be a big big issue and hopefully it's a micro trend it is a micro trend that turns into one that's even more um bigger and more robust for brands to step up to. Yeah. That is so encouraging. Yes. Thank yeah, you. That's Very wonderful. Nice. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, it's also a great place um, for us to have to end this. Unfortunately, um, we're at the end of our hour. Um, and I know we could have gone on for two and we were, <laughs> we were wondering if we could, but we knew it was going to last a good long time and a good conversation. <laughs> Thank you both for doing this, for spending the time with us. And I, I recommend um, any brands that are looking for, Clean Beauty Advice to Dr. Krupa. Um, I, and I recommend anyone out there who's looking for a beauty brand to have as a comparison on their shelf to others. I recommend Prima any day, any any day for sure. Um, and if you missed out on the live part of this, um, please send questions. We'll perhaps pass the questions on to the two of you to see if there's any yeah. other things that we can ask um, from our audience members. Um, thank you again for doing this for our Think and Link. And uh, I look forward to our future conversations. Thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you for having us. Aaron and Kelly, it was an honor. And Cooper, this, it's such a pleasure and, and to connect. And so I'm honored to share the share the stage. And again, to, to the Aaron, your commentary, if anyone has any questions or comments, you could always reach out to me directly, Christopher at Prima.co. I'm here for you. Love hearing from people and always uh, want to be a helpful resource. That was great. Thank you. That was great. Thank you both. All right. Have a good Thank one. you. Take care, Take everyone. Care. Thank you. All right.